Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. It's episode number 593. It's so great to have you here tonight. We've got a very special guest. Wukash Arshinsky is here with us uh, via the wonders of the internet and uh, Skype. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be talking with us now. He's from uh, Pine64. He's going to be talking with us about all that's to come from Pine64 in the course of 2019. And believe me, there are some exciting announcements that uh, we're going to be lifting the embargo on tonight. So uh, make sure you stick around. We're going to be learning about some really great devices from a fantastic company. We're also going to be taking a look at their single board computer called the Rock Pro 64. We want to see how it performs for us out of the box with the vanilla Armbian uh, install. And uh, lots of great stuff to come for you tonight. So stick around. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. It's episode number 593. Nice to have you all here. We've got a fantastic show planned for you. You notice I've got a Rock Pro 64 all set up. Well, that's because we got some announcements from Pine 64 for you tonight. We're going to be testing that board and seeing just kind of how well it performs as a single board computer. And you're going to find out why we care about that so much. I care a lot. In just a couple of minutes' time, we've got Wukash Erchinsky is joining us tonight from Pine64. And very excited to have him on board and uh, here with us uh, via Skype video yeah. um, to speak about the very things that they are releasing from Pine64 at FOSDEM this week. Yes. yes! So if you are interested, I know you are. You're interested in open source? Yeah, check. Mm -hmm. You're interested in single board computers? Yep. Check. Oh, yes. Interested in SOC, system on chip? Yeah. Yep. Check. And you're interested in hardware that is really, really good, but really, really affordable? Check. Check. Uh, and mate. And uh, so this is going to be a great show for you. What's new with you two? Good to see you. I bought some Bluetooth headphones. You bought some Bluetooth headphones. Are I they did. earbuds or headphones? They like are the actual no, earbuds cups. Okay, yeah. Or we're the gym, so that's new for me. Oh. Yeah, from uh, Blitzwolf. And they're uh, they're nice to have, eh? They're very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they showed up yesterday. Finally got cool. them and uh, gave them a test run, and I love them. I love Bluetooth. I, I've it's grown on me. I, I think originally like the whole wireless headphones, and you know, Apple has pulled the headphone jack from there. Yes. I don't like that. I'll be honest with you because I do, like you, Sure. I listen to things at night. And yes. it's nice to have the headphones that plug in. Right. Yeah. yeah. I have a pillow speaker. So I'm sorry, what? A pillow, a pillow speaker. speaker. So when you lay your head on the pillow, you actually hear whatever's playing on your phone. But nobody else does. But nobody else does. So and you have to be a side sleeper for that then. Yeah, oh, well, but I also have the, the, the head wrap. Do you wear that and <laughs> I, I had been wearing it, but but I stopped wearing it and switched to pillow speaker. So I have mine in, like, joyful anticipation for some time being able to take a nap on my lunch break, which has not happened it's ever. never happened. Never, yeah. ever happened, right. but I haven't. I <laughs> Where it would you take a nap? In my big, heavy backpack. I don't, we have adjustment tables. You take tables. a backpack? Or you just on an take adjustment a nap in your table? backpack? <laughs> no, I have my, I have the wrap. I bought those, too, oh, right? Oh, gotcha. So just because one day I feel like I'm gonna have time to take a nap. I'm so excited for that moment. I have those. So you carry them with you every at all single times? day, like in joyful anticipation. Don't wear them while you're driving, Sasha. No, I will not. No, definitely. <laughs> one day I'll it's take a, a sleeping nap. mask it's with built-in speakers. <laughs> yeah. So, so that said, like the headphone jack is really important to me in my phone because yep. I. I don't want Bluetooth because Bluetooth lasts, you know, several hours, but you've got problems with heat if it's mm -hmm. in a pillow or something like that. So That's I know I'm, I'm kind of silly that way. No, but those are all good things to think about. I like podcasts. Podcasts are good. Helps me sleep. Mm -hmm. It gets my mind off things. Uh, there's the new one from, um, uh, it's called Inventions. Okay. I'm really, you know, I'm just getting into it and kind of enjoying it. The, yeah. the guys are, are really good. It's uh, it's from the same guys that bring you Stuff You, stuff you Should Know. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, stuff yeah, You yeah. Should Know. Yeah. I actually, I, okay, I like that um, So Josh and Chuck, like, yeah. I listen to them a lot, yeah. but but um, they were talking about inventions just the other day, so I'm like, okay, well, I'll give it a try, because, you know, Josh and Chuck bring out a, an episode every couple of days, so this mm -hmm. gives me something in between, mm -hmm. um, and they're talking about chopsticks. 
I'm like, okay, well, that's topical. I eat a lot of ramen. That's not really an invention, though. It's been around for a while. It's been around for, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, <laughs> it's a show about inventions, and they're like, well, we can't really track it down to when it was invented, but it's always existed. Oh, so it's not just like current <laughs> new inventions. No, it might be like, no, oh, the, not the day necessarily. They toast was. Not necess- yeah, <laughs> exactly. Sliced bread, yeah, that's a big one. Here's an invention. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was invented at some point, but we can't really tell you when. <laughs> that's right. Kind of been around for Didn't a while. Really yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that's good. So Bluetooth so earbuds, what about you? What's new with you? What's new with me other than like... How's, can I ask, yeah. how's the Odroid Go okay. going? Okay, it is going amazingly. Yeah. And it is the showpiece at my house right now. So anytime oh. anybody comes over, Dave's like, look at this. Look what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but the thing, the, the the fact of the matter is, I mean, it's so perfect and portable that you can really just, you, I mean, somebody comes over, you can really just shove it in their hands and be like, okay, play this. And, and yeah. all of a sudden they're amazed, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's well, great. And one of our viewers was on linuxtechshow.com and said, you know, I really want to be able to do video game emulation, retro gaming emulation, yeah. but it never works for me. Right. It never works for me. So grab an Odroid Go. This is like a Game Boy form factor, a little bit thinner. Yeah. I mean, I'd say about a third the thickness. Like this. Don't but it's a kicking around the studio somewhere? I don't have it here because oh. you know what? The kids love it. Yeah. Fair enough. My youngest absolutely loves playing Nintendo Entertainment System on the Odroid Go. So consider this is a retro gaming system that allows you to emulate on an SD card. It, it's all like built in. The emulators are fantastic. Yeah. The audio is great. The video is great. True. The gameplay is like the form factor is that of a Game Boy. Exactly. Yeah. It's intuitive. And it was funny with the volume because I didn't know exactly how it worked. Okay. So, but it's like I, a toggle. I, like it's up, a toggle. Up, up, down. And then done. Yeah. Up, up, yeah. Up. Down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, but you had said that you can just like resume where you left off in a yes. game. Yes. And that it's was one of the mind blowing features of the Odroid Go. It's incredible for somebody like me who like has a moment to start something, but I don't want to yeah. lose it forever. Well, so. Jeff, have you ever played like Sega Genesis? Yes. And you get into a game, yep. let's say Sonic the Hedgehog, and you get so, so far, yep. and then, oh, it's time for dinner. I got to shut it off. And you've got to start back at level one. Every time. I thought you could say, well, anyway. No, yes. you couldn't. You, you could, couldn't? You, could, you could learn the codes. There was like an up, up, right, down, down, left, codes, right, left, yes. right, A, A, B, B. The codes. Right, right, right. But you could never save your position in the game. Right. With the Odroid Go, you, as you've probably found. Yep. You can. It does. Yeah. If you're in the middle of a game, it just memorizes where you are. If you turn it off and then you turn it back on, you fire up that game, boom, you're back where you so left off. you're playing Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time on it. You're in the middle of a swing, turn it off. Boom. Turn it back on Done. and the swing continues. Yes. Absolutely. That's amazing. I yeah. know it's great. Prince of Persia. That's awesome. Right in the middle. Yes. Very cool. So. That's a very cool feature. I know. So I'm expecting that our, the sales of Ojoy Grows are going to go through the roof. You just want to be an right so, unofficial right so. spokesperson, exactly. don't you? Yeah. Where's Another, our stickers? Yeah, I know. Where's exactly. our stickers? Yeah. They're, they're in the mail. Excellent. Yeah, how's that coming? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's cold out, so. <laughs> what about you? You know, you always ask us what's you know going on in tech. What's for going us, on never, for tech for me? Um, well, I'm really excited about what's going on tonight because leading up to this week's episode, I've been speaking with the folks at Pine64. Yeah. I've been speak and, and working with them. Um, if you follow my blog at baldnerd.com, if you forget the the domain name, just look at my face. <laughs> um, on on my blog, I posted a, an entry this uh, this morning, yes. uh, which I'm not going to tell you about right now because I want you to tune into the show and find out what's to come. But we've been talking about all these amazing things that Pine64 is doing. Pine64 being like a single board computer manufacturer that I'm really excited about the brand because they, they not only make a great board, we found that mm-hmm. with the A64 Plus, the A64 LTS, the Rock 64, the Rock Pro 64, Were they're they really also excelling. Not the best for the Google score? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, oh yeah, and and they're really excelling at the single board computer, um, but they also understand community, and I really mm-hmm. absolutely adore that about them. And it's not it's not the community 
grabbing hold of the board. It's the manufacturer grabbing hold of the community and saying, yes. we love you. We want to work with you to make this thing really awesome. Yeah. That's a completely different kind of paradigm as far as business goes. Mm -hmm. And as a Linux lover, I absolutely adore that. So I'm very excited about Pine64 right now. Yes. And tonight we're looking at some things that are coming up from them. And I'm really excited to unveil this for you. I'm not going to do it, but Wukash is here uh, via the internet. We've got Skype video with, uh, with Wukash from Pine64. We're going to be talking with him in just a couple minutes time. So you ask, you know, what's exciting for me in tech? Really? It's That's kind of it, yeah. Um, other than that, I mean, Kingston Technology is uh, one of our partners. We love them and we work with them. Uh, I'm really excited about some of the encryption devices that oh. they're bringing yeah, out. Okay. We're going to be looking like at them on the, the show. USB. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have one of those, the yes. USB Kingston, you know. Yeah. I, I just want to know that my data is safe. So and what else right. are they coming up? Well, coming they've got with. the Data Traveler 2000, and the yeah. Data Traveler 2000 is a USB flash drive that has a built-in keypad. Oh. Uh-huh. So with that, with the keypad, you can decrypt your files and then plug it into your computer. But because it's built into the device... You can also plug it into your TV. You can plug it into any right. device that reads USB, and it's not, it's completely 100% platform agnostic. It doesn't oh. care if you're on Windows or Linux or Mac or Chrome no or whatever you're on, that is it cool. will work. Okay. Plug it into the side of your TV, and it will, will, because you punched in your password, right. it will decrypt the videos that are on that or the JPEGs that are on that. But someone walks yeah, away with cool. it, steals it from you, they can't open the files. That's, I like that. That's the whole idea between the Data Traveler that 2000. Cool. And so I'm really, really keen on that right now, too. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of really cool stuff happening in 2019. Category 5 is going to be at the forefront. We're going to be showing you everything as it happens. And uh, we've got some great giveaways coming up over the past, uh, over the next uh, couple of months as well uh, as the, the season progresses. So yeah. very, very excited about all that's to come. It's going to be a good year. Yeah. We've <laughs> I got knew 2019 was going to be good. It's yeah. going to be amazing. And it's so nice to have you along. Thanks for being a patron as well. Uh, if you are a patron, well, you already know some of the behind the scenes stuff that's going on. And it is incredibly exciting. I just got to say, if you're a patron, you already know. And it's amazing. And uh, you've got the inside scoop. The inside skinny. And all it takes is a buck a month to be a part of our Patreon page. Category 5 on Patreon is found at patreon.com slash category 5. Um, so please do uh, consider supporting us if you haven't already. Uh, we've got to take a really quick break. When we come back, uh, we're going to be talking with w Wukash Erichinski, and he is from Pine64. We're going to be talking to him about what is coming up in 2019 from Pine64. Stick around. Whether you shop on ThinkGeek, GearBest, B&H Photo Video, eBay, or Amazon, or even if you want a free trial of Audible, you'll find the best deals and support the shows we produce by simply visiting the shopping sites you already frequent by using the links on our website. Visit Category5.tv slash partners for the full and ever-growing list and help us create more free content like this show. Thank you for shopping with our partners, and thank you for watching. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. On the other side of the studio is Robbie. We kicked him over there because he's got some exciting news from Pine64. Thanks, Jeff. Today, I am joined by Wukash Erkinski, and he is here from Pine64. We're getting really excited about all that's to come over the next, well, over the course of 2019. And here to tell us all about it, Wukash, it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Cheers, Robbie. Can you tell us a little bit, just briefly, what makes Pine64? I mean, I know the answer to this. I know why our community is so excited about Pine64. But from your perspective within the company, what is different about your company? You know, I think that um, especially since we introduced the Pine book, um, we kind of have 
grown past, in a sense, um, past the SBC single board computer business. I mean, mm-hmm. single board computers are still our bread and butter. It's what we do. But uh, Tia Lim, who is the founder of uh, Pine64, clearly has a much broader vision for what Pine64 is supposed to be in time, you know? Mm-hmm. So the Pine book is clearly a step in the direction of opening up a, um, a broader spectrum of devices based on the SOCs that are used in our single board computer. Mm-hmm. And um, the Pine book was a first step. This year, we're looking at introducing the Pine tab and subsequently the Pine phone. We have been, you know, here at Fostum, we're announcing uh, dev kits for the Pine phone. Um, it's a big step towards, you know, yet another thing in our line of, um, of devices that will be wonderful. Uh, can I, we can I touch on the Pine phone just really quickly? Because yeah. I know we've, we've mentioned it here on the show before, and, and the specifications are you know, not up there with the latest and greatest Android phone. I think it's important for us to know who it's for and why it's so exciting. So for me, what is exciting about the Pine phone immediately is openness. Think about a phone where you have absolute control over the operating system. You're not locked into a service provider. You're not locked into an OS. That is an astonishing venture. Absolutely correctly. So the whole point of the Pine phone is to have mainline Linux running on this device. Uh, We are working hard with, you know, a number of uh, projects that would be, you know, UB ports, post-market OS, uh, KDE guys, uh, Plenty others. Mm-hmm. And uh, the idea is to create something that is not supposed to rival your, you know, daily driver, not your iPhone, not your, you know, um, Pixel or what have you. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be a privacy-oriented phone running mainline Linux for those people who, uh, you know, cherish and value privacy and for those who may need it in their business, um, you know, in their organizations. Um, you know, we're introducing, well... The Pine phone is going to have features such as, you know, uh, physical switches for the camera, for the um, wow, uh, for the LTE module, for uh, for speakers. So and these are you know, actual want, toggle switches to enable and disable by hardware, not software. That's absolutely correct. Yes. So completely physical switches, which will be, you know, which are already there in the dev kits, which we're demoing here at Fostum, mm-hmm. uh, but they will find themselves um, into the actual product. I think that's really important from a, a privacy stand, standpoint for those of us who are concerned about that. Uh, and I think that's becoming more and more of a concern these days, especially in 2019, uh, because, you know, realize folks that with a hardware toggle switch to turn off your webcam, a hacker cannot re-enable it. With a software Correct. switch, a hacker can re-enable your webcam and you don't even know that it's on. Hardware, it's off, it's completely disabled from the OS and inaccessible. So that's exciting. So as, Wukash, as, um, as the Pine phone is going to be to the latest and greatest Android phone, that, that's kind of where the Pine book has landed in that it's not meant to be the most powerful laptop, it's meant to be uh, an entry level for something that's new and exciting and a completely different um, kind of grade of, I, I don't, it's never been done before from, from what I know. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely correct, Robbie. The, you know, the whole point of the Pine Book was when I first wrote a post about it, you know, Pine Book, what to expect. You know, mm-hmm. I ended the whole uh, post on the, on the forum with writing, you know, if you expect this to replace your work or school laptop, mm-hmm. don't. That's, that's not the point. Of not the, the intention yeah. at all. Mm-hmm. Not at all. It was meant for, you know, for tinkers, for learning uh, Linux, um, for people who just wanted to get into ARM devices and cool. wanted, you know, a, a package of sorts rather than having, you know, a separate screen and a board and all that. Yeah. Um, so uh, it never was meant to be seen as a, uh, you know, as a, as a full-fledged laptop in a sense. You know, it was meant for tinkers. What we initially envisioned was because, you know, there's so much space in the chassis and there's an uh, exposed USB header inside. We thought, you know, people would be um, hacking, uh, you know, 
mobile connectivity into it. We mm -hmm. thought, you know, people may um, do some GPO stuff on the go with it, which is possible, you know, uh, via um, uh, the SD card slot and, and, you know, these sort of things. These were our, you know, our assumptions. But people went out and did a lot of other the cool things um, with, with the Pine Book, you know, and it clearly, there is clearly a market among the tinkers for this sort of device. Very cool. And, and, you have shown, Pine64 has shown that um, single board computing is now entering the next level. I mean, the Rock Pro 64 is an astounding board. I, it, you could use it as your set-top box, and it, it's a fantastic system. Mm. So now I just want to, first of all, before we talk about what's to come from Pine64, Ukash, I just want to thank you for choosing to be on Category 5 Technology TV this week. Um, and for those of you watching, we should understand that the information that you're about to learn is under embargo. And we're about to lift that embargo, which means this is brand new information that Wukash is about to share. So Wukash, thank you for choosing our community to release this information. Could you share with us what is next for the Pine Book? So this year we're introducing the Pine Book Pro. Um, in a sense, it is a part of a um, uh, of, of the Brock Pro 64 lineage, in mm -hmm. a sense. It features the same SOC, um, same memory, and we expect it to be uh, completely compatible with the single board computer that, is, that we have rolled out mm -hmm. uh, last year. Basically, what we're doing is we're taking the uh, Rock Pro 64 as a, as a starting point. And uh, the, the board is not going to be in the Pinebook Pro. It's a custom PCB, which is being developed uh, for the laptop. Yep. But uh, we um, are kind of creating a continuity in a sense that those operating systems which have already come to the, Pine, uh, to the Rock uh, Pro 64 will make an appearance definitely down the line on the Pinebook Pro. It is much more powerful than the Pinebook. Um, has much more memory, has four gigs of RAM, and we expect that, you know, this could really be a daily driver. And it comes, really? you know, with features that, you know, there's so many people out there who these days, you know, take a, um, a Chromebook and they transform it into a, uh, a Linux laptop. Sure. And, you know, that's, that's, that's fantastic. And in a sense, uh, we looked at that market and we thought, you know, what about a, you know, a, a proper laptop, a, a real laptop replacement based on, you know, ARM64 um, architecture uh, that, you know, that is built from the ground up with free and open source software in mind. And, when, uh, you know, and having features which you rarely find on high-end or um, mid-range Chromebooks, such as, you know, a lot Fantastic. of uh, internal storage, uh, 1080p IPS panels, you know, these sort of things, as well as high quality of uh, materials for the build. I mean, we're using um, alu an aluminum alloy um, for the Pinebook Pro, you know. Wow. So, okay. This is, uh, I mean, this is uh, uh, groundbreaking, that you're, you're changing the entire world of single board computing, SOC, uh, with the release of the Pinebook Pro. Um, so I think, okay, there's lots of laptops that are available. There are a lot of Chromebooks that I could convert to Linux. Uh, and so the immediate thought that comes to mind is price point. Um, we all know, of course, Pine64 is all about open platforms, and so we can expect the same from this device. Um, so without getting too much into that, just real quick, price. One hundred and ninety-nine dollars. One hundred and ninety-nine bucks. That. That's what we're aiming for. Uh, we're looking into, you know, we also heard our community. People are, you know, talking about that shipping costs a lot in the yeah. current arrangement which we have. Um, we're looking into that as well. Uh, we hope that, you know, whatever we do for the Pinebook Pro is going to translate also down to the regular Pinebook. So wonderful. You know, there's more info on that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> saying we've got it all figured out. But sure, least, yeah. You know, we, we're thinking about it. With, with that in mind, uh, what kind of timeline are we looking at for the Pinebook Pro? You know, second half of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, literally, the first prototype is here. We've got three prototypes. Uh, you know, they will go to our, you know, three prototypes going mm -hmm. to three key projects 
that we're working with, we're left with no prototypes at this oh, time. Yeah? So, so the so projects such as um, developers of the operating systems to be able to build for the uh, for the Pinebook Pro. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we want to have you know at least two or three you know um, operating systems in place yeah. for when it rolls out, and you know we also gonna have a scheme where developers will get their um, you know. Um, other developers, other developers will get their units a bit earlier ahead of uh, you know um, uh, users, so that they can port their OSs. Right. To, to cool. Pinebook now, well. because because it's uh, because the Pinebook Pro is is generally, as you mentioned, a Rock Pro 64 at its heart. It, does that mean that the transition period for those operating systems is it going to be a lot? easier for them to develop operating systems for these uh, Pinebook Pros just because it's already available for the Rock Pro 64? So here's the thing. Um, I'm, I'm not the most technical guy out sure. there. And I don't want to pretend, you know, like I, like I know the, the answer with all certainty. What I can tell you is that from talking to, you know, the key projects um, that we work with, it, it does appear that it's a question of changing out the device tree and you know uh, supporting the the features which you would expect in a laptop so you know the yeah. lcd and uh, panel right. and you know the battery and stuff like that but it, in principle it appears that you know the porting period should be much shorter than um, in the case of a completely new soc you know something that nobody has ever worked on mm -hmm. that sort of thing so yeah very good, very good. Uh, okay, so beyond the Pinebook Pro, there are some other exciting things coming out of Pine64 uh, during 2019. Now, one of the things that we've been looking at here on Category 5 Technology TV is the smart home, uh, smart uh, surveillance as a good example. Uh, but one of the concerns that we have with the smart home is, you know, where is our data? How is the cloud interacting with our information and how is it being stored uh, from a privacy perspective, essentially? And, and so having control over our cloud data, having control over our surveillance and things like that, it's all very important to, uh, to us this year as we think about our, our data privacy. Um, so maybe you can share a little bit about, I, I mean, we know, again, Pine64, I can't stress enough, is all about, we've found, um, openness and uh, creating platforms that are hackable and that you can work with. So I'm really excited about this new product called Cube. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So Cube is, to our knowledge, one of the first, if not the first, completely open source IP cam. Um, we have already approached uh, developers who, um, you know, who, who deal with this area of Linux um, and spoken to them and listened to what it is that they would you know, like to see in such a camera, and we got a lot of feedback. And we uh, we actually had a prototype at Fostum last year, so this is you know long in the making. Um, mm -hmm. This is this isn't new stuff. I mean, we 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 talked to developers for a year to see what it is that they'd like to see in one of those cameras, and I think we we nailed it in a sense. Um, I think that, uh, you know, a, we, we're using an SOC which is very low powered, but it is pretty much completely mainlined. So already. So even, you know, oh, yeah. so there isn't much on our end that we need to do. Sung Si does incredible work on these all winner processors. And, so so uh, again, does this fall into, hey, it's going to be easier to port our software to? It will be easier for developers to port their software to it. To be Fantastic. Specific. Yeah. So it will be, uh, you know, the Linux is in very good shape on it. Uh, I understand that there are certain questions of implementing the actual um, sensor at this time. You know, we don't have an ETA for when the cube is going to be available, but it will be available this year. And we're looking at, you know, um, having it uh, function in both indoors and outdoors. Um, Wonderful. That, that's, yeah. uh, that brings me to one of the things that's really exciting for me about um, the hackability of the Cube um, camera is uh, the GPIO. And, and could you share with us the, uh, you know, the, the, this camera? So the, think about this. Inside the camera, there's a full GPIO. Can you tell us what that can be used for, Wukash? Plenty of things. Uh, but one of the things is that we are thinking about a motorized case. For for um, for the cube, 
which would allow users to you know um, to interact with the camera and basically you know have ha have the camera move in um, four axes and uh, you know um, you could have uh, all sorts of robotic applications. I know that people also have uh, you know thought about people who fly drones and stuff like that are really excited about this. I, I find it like. What a brilliant idea. So rather than having to buy a different camera to have pan and tilt features, I have yeah. the same camera and I just add the GPIO component for pan, pan and tilt. Uh, and then the software is hackable. So if I want to add digital zoom, uh, which brings me also, um, so specifications wise, do you know the resolution of the camera at this point? From the top of my head, I believe it's eight megapixels. Okay. But so, please don't quote me on this because this is, I'm doing this from memory, but okay. I am pretty sure that it is 8 megapixel um, Sony sensor. Fantastic. Um, I'm looking to see if I have the specifications. I do not. Will it shoot 1080p video? Are you yes, aware? I'm sure that it will shoot 1080p yeah. video. At 8 megapixels, yeah, we'd be able to take some really high quality stills and, and do 1080p video, uh, which would be fantastic. So again, not quoting on that. I do see it's the uh, IMX179, so those of you who would like to look it up. And all of the specifications uh, are going to be listed in the, uh, the description below. So if you're interested in the Pinebook Pro, the Cube, I've got those specifications listed there for you, so check those out. Um, Beyond that, I mean, you guys are working on uh, things like a retro gaming case. Anything else exciting from Pine64? I mean, this is huge. You guys are, are making some amazing waves in, uh, in what SOC is going to mean. And I think knowing that we're going to be able to get a Pinebook Pro, which is going to be um, on par with uh, like a, a good medium uh, or a high-end Chromebook at that price point, is just that's mind-boggling. I'm happy to hear that you're excited. Yeah, yeah I sure mean, am. we we've got a few things in store. You know, we're also making um, the Pine Tab, yeah, which is a, a tablet which is going to have a uh, magnetically um, attachable keyboard that's going <laughs> to double up as a as a cover. That's based on the A64. Um, okay. Uh, we're uh, updating um, the much beloved Rock 64. And uh, we're taking another stab at uh, the Pine H64, which we introduced last year. It didn't really, you know, we listen to the community. And uh, when the community comes back to us and says, you know, this really isn't up to scratch, you know, th this isn't what we hoped and expected, you know, we go back and we really do, you know, take it on board. So, you know, we're taking another um, stab at you know uh, the H6 SOC from All Winner mm -hmm. um, this year, and uh, in a smaller form factor with integrated Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. You know, for all of those who who really hope to see a Pine 64 board with uh, you know a module already uh, soldered onto the board. Wonderful. Well, I mean, to you, to the team, uh, keep up the great work. We're really excited to, uh, to you know, get to... We, we've had so much fun playing with Pine64 boards over the past several That's months. They've just been, you know, uh, one of those product lines that, honestly, I can say, has been impressing us. And, and you are just showing us today um, that that is going to continue in 2019. And so keep up the great work. Thank you, Robbie. Mukesh, okay. thank you so much for joining us, and thank you again for choosing Category 5 TV um, to unveil this information. Take care, man. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Oh, I love it. I am so excited. That was an excellent, excellent interview. I definitely want to put that on my Christmas list. Yes. Okay. All right, so the one thing we uh, learned amongst the many things that we learned is that the uh, Pinebook Pro is built off the Rock Pro 64. Right. And if you're watching going, oh, what's the Rock Pro 64? I've never used them before. How does it perform? Is this thing going to like blow my mind? Yes. And we are going to be taking a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to take a look at one of those and see just how well it performs. So you'll get a uh, sense of what it's going to be like as a laptop.
For a limited time, get your hands on limited edition shirts from the Category 5 TV network. These high quality shirts are manufactured by Teespring, a fundraising website, and your purchase will help support the shows we produce. Get yours today and send us your pictures to be featured on the corresponding show. Visit cat5.tv slash shirts to support us and get your official network shirt today. cat5.tv slash shirts. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Before the break, Jeff was mentioning to you that we're going to be looking at a Rock Pro 64. So we understand now that Pine 64 has taken the Rock Pro 64 um, SOC mm -hmm. and built it into a new single board um, kind of circuit. Um, I don't know, like a uh, for a laptop, a, basically. Yeah. They've taken that thing, and flattened it out, made it a little bit bigger, and yeah. put it into a laptop form factor, and it's super sweet. I don't think that's the technical way but of doing it. that's how I, I think of it. They just, <laughs> but, like, they take it, and if then I, they just... Yeah, like, here, here it is. Well, and, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, I and I don't... It's on, and I don't want to get shocked, but... So they basically made it into a laptop form yeah. factor because, as as Wukash was mentioning, it's it's not the same board; it's just the same components right. Right. built Spread into up. a laptop board. And now it's like a an aluminum magnesium alloy chassis, oh, which I was so excited to a hear. Full size key, like a nice keyboard with the keys in the correct positioning. Yeah. So you know, if you if you ever have encountered a, a laptop or even a Pine Book where the keys are kind of like, hey, why is this why is the slash key in such a weird spot mm -hmm. well yeah. it looks to me from the from the shots that they sent that hey this thing is they've fixed the keyboard up and it looks mm -hmm. really really good so I'm really excited about it but really what it boils down to is how's it going to perform and and when Wukash said hey this thing is based on the Rock Pro 64 I said well I got one of those <laughs> yeah so how is this going to perform so you think about a $200 laptop and you think okay well this thing is going to be sluggish for surfing the web, it's going to be really, really slow. Right. Like at that thing, price like, point, when I go to buy a laptop, I don't look at anything less than seven hundred bucks. Right, because I know it's going to be slow less than that. I'm just saying that my mentality is that that's where it's going to fall. Right. Right. Now, the, keep in mind the Pinebook Pro is not going to fall into that at, at all. It, this is Correct. this is earth changing right now because what Pine 64 is doing is taking that SOC, uh, the uh, the the system on chip, and making it into a laptop that is really quite powerful. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very, very excited about this. So let's look at the Rock Pro 64, which the Pinebook Pro is based on, just to get a sense of how it's going to perform. Right. So what I've done, now we understand the Pinebook Pro is a Rock Pro 64 with a 64 gig eMMC. Mm -hmm. um, if you are a part of the Pine 64 community, they're going to actually upgrade that to 128 gigs for you. Oh, beautiful. Awesome. What? Thank you. Become a part of the community, folks. Um, so with that in mind, I am using eMMC tonight on the Rock Pro 64, but I've only got a 16 gig uh, EMMC card, so okay. I actually have less capacity. But I've installed um, I've installed Armbian, which is oh. like a Debian. Uh, it's based on Ubuntu, and it's basically just a Linux distro that I can download and install on a Rock Pro 64. Mm -hmm. Similarly, with a uh, with a Pinebook Pro, you can download Linux, you can install it, and and you're up and running. So let's just get right over to it, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Rock Pro 64. Now. Let's let's take a quick look. How how does it respond? Now I've downscaled the screen to 720p because I had trouble at a full 1080p. I had trouble seeing the uh, <laughs> the text. It was so tiny. I needed like a 55 inch TV or something to be able to see that. <laughs> but for your sake at home, I wanted to I wanted to show you what it was going to look like at 720p. So you see what I did is I went in here and changed the resolution. But resolution wise, I mean it's got it can scale right up. Uh, of course, it's got 4K capabilities as well. So if I had a 4K uh, device, I'd be able to go up to that. So all I've done with Armbian is I've just installed a couple of things like uh, LibreOffice because I wanted to know, you know, I'm going to be using it as a, as a desktop computer, as a laptop computer. How's it going to perform when I bring up a writer? And boom. That's fast. That's faster than my computer. It's just fast. Oh, it's what you expect from, uh, from a laptop computer. Like that's kind yeah. of the, the performance that you would expect. Close it. 
and it's gone. Um, I mean, what else can you possibly check? I mean, you've got... GIMP? Do you have GIMP on there? I did put GIMP on here as another uh, quick test. So here's the GNU Image Manipulation Program, version 2.8, yeah. and it's up on the screen, wow, ready quick. to go. Um, I don't really have any images <laughs> to, to play with. I mean, I guess I could, I could open up my desktop wallpaper uh, in the GIMP. Let's see. So open, and it's just in my downloads. There we go. Uh, there we are. Grabbed it from pexels.com. Came up just fine. Now, what's the resolution of that? That's 4,013 by 2675. Hello, so, quick. yeah, remember that I am doing this right now on a single board computer. Right. Yeah. This is an SBC. Like, everything's built into this. And, and this is what you're going to experience from the Pinebook Pro. This is the kind of performance, bringing up a 4,000 by whatever image in the GIMP. In GNU like image. Yeah, yeah just that, like that. That is indeed faster than my work computer. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Even just as it is. So yeah. being realistic, like, is it the fastest computer that I have? No, I've got a 24-core computer with 96 gigs of RAM on my desk. Right. Okay? Yeah. So is it the fastest thing? No. But as far as a portable laptop, so something that I can take with me to the coffee shop, do some writing on, do some surfing on, get onto Discord, say hi to my friends, and do my usual day-to-day -day stuff. Yeah. I'm probably not going to do video production on it. Guaranteed I'm not. Right. I'm, right. I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek. I'm not going to do video production <laughs> on it. But for my daily driver, for the laptop that I'm going to carry around with me at 200 bucks. Right. This thing is blowing my mind. Yeah. Okay, you know what's going through my head? I, I, I'm picturing get, you know, my wife surprising me, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, with this for Christmas. Mm. Uh, but then as well... It's only January, Jeff. <laughs> she's got time to save up the 200 bucks. Uh, but then, you know, she buys it early, gets it to you and says, Hey, Robbie, I need you to get this all set up. And as well, with a, a window where he can play all of his ROMs. There you go. Yeah, use it as an emulator. This That's would be right. a sick emulator. I dude. know. All, all Could you imagine the power? Emulator. Oh. I'm picturing all the the little single board computers and their giggle scores just giggling away, and then this guy here <laughs> with his evil laugh. Mwah, uh, 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 That's uh. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the future. <laughs> exactly. Here but I no, am. No, that performed real, like yeah. really, really well. And That's to get that real as, time. A, as a laptop, that's amazing. Yeah, that's real time, folks. I mean, it's not uh, it's not at all a comprehensive review of the system, but I mean. Hey, it operates really fast. Yes. I mean, folks in the chat, uh, you see in Discord saying, like, this is faster. This looks better than my, my desktop yeah. computer, my work computer. And it just, I mean, it operates just fine. I gotta, I'd, I'd have to grab, like, a key. I've got a keyboard over here if I wanted to bring up, like, YouTube or something. Yeah. Let me, let me just do, do that. Let's do that. Yeah? Because Can I do that? Yeah, to That's be honest Robbie with you. Gets really big on camera. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, do. All right, so I've got a, a wireless keyboard that's uh, connected into our Rock Pro 64 here. So let's see if it's working here. YouTube.com, yeah. And you see the responsiveness. Mm -hmm. there, sometimes with a, an SBC, a single board computer, hit enter, that might help. <laughs> uh, sometimes with a single board computer, as I'm typing, it doesn't keep up with the right. speed that I type. Yes. And so I can feel that latency. Uh, I didn't feel it there. So, um, all right, so here we are. Let's go YouTube.com slash... Category 5. Dot, uh, category 5 that TV? Team. No, I think it's Cat 5 TV on YouTube, I, isn't it? I do believe it. No, no, that's Facebook. I don't know. It's, it's, hard, oh, to yeah, it's hard to remember. There every, every, there we go. We're live. There's Sasha. There's us from last week. Ooh, that was Can a I good, just good, great interview. interview. Oh, yeah. Um, so there we go. Quick. Yeah. So how's it going to operate here? Could yeah, be that, our that could, could be, be feed. That could be our internet, but you know what else that could be? I have not installed there are um, 3D acceleration drivers. Mm -hmm. I haven't installed right. anything okay. for that kind of stuff. Right. So that's probably a key component that I'm going to need to do. And right. certainly if you want to do any gaming on it, you're going to get in I'm I'm on Armbian. Uh, so, so when you install the distro on this board or on your uh, Pinebook Pro, uh, you're going to install like drivers and things like that. This is like a base vanilla install. I haven't done anything. But as far as performance for office connectivity goes, perfect. Perfect. Yes. As far as being able to use my Google Docs, Google Drive, 
all that stuff is going to be perfect out of the box. And if I want to do anything extra, then I'm definitely going to be able to do that as soon as I install <laughs> that Armbian. Uh, there you go. Uh, Wukash is even saying you need to install the Armbian patch uh, to run YouTube with hardware acceleration. You oh, see that uh, right over there. So that's part, of the, you know, this is this is one of the things. Some people will, uh, I've received some messages where people have said, um, there, there isn't support for this or there isn't support for that. One of the things that's really cool about the Rock Pro 64, the Pinebook Pro, is that it's community supported. So mm -hmm. um, folks who um, are able to do development are doing it in an open source manner. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing more and more um, patches little features and, and new distros and things like that. So as Bukash is saying there, uh, you can see in Discord that uh, you've got to install those uh, hardware acceleration drivers. You're going to encounter that, well, this stuff is now available. This stuff is ready for you and you can install it, but I haven't because this is <laughs> right. a vanilla install. <laughs> so. Cool, that's amazing. Gives us a great impression anyways of, you know, the out of, out of the box experience and that's going to be really, really good. I'm so excited about yeah. this thing. Oh, I know. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah. Um, Sasha, we've got to head over to the newsroom. Um, so if you're ready for us. I certainly am. Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.TV newsroom. The Raspberry Pi Foundation has updated its compute module with better thermals, an updated application processor, and more flash memory. Facebook has revealed plans to integrate WhatsApp, Instagram, and Messenger. Apple says it's banning Facebook's research app that collects users' personal information. And IBM hopes one million faces will help fight bias in facial recognition. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. Jeff Weston. Yeah, man. You're building a brand new beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? Just because Jeff is confused doesn't mean you have to be. Visit cat5.tv slash dreamhost to sign up for unlimited web hosting for your website with unlimited email accounts, MySQL databases, the latest version of PHP, WordPress, and more, and even a free domain name registration. It's less than $6 per month, so sign up today. cat5.tv slash dreamhost. I'm Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. The Raspberry Pi Foundation has updated its compute module with better thermals, an updated application processor, and more flash memory. The compute module 3 Plus, a system on module, S which is an SOM board, is part of a hardware family that's been around since 2014 with the launch of the CM1. That module had a single core core ARM processor clocked to 700 megahertz, 512 megabytes of RAM, and a 4 gigabyte EM EMMC. Three years later, the Compute Module 3 was released with the 1.2 gigahertz processor of the Pi 3 and, and 1 gigabyte of RAM. Here we are two years later and the Compute Module 3 Plus is carrying on the tradition, adding the processor from the Pi 3 B Plus into the mix. It's the size of a DDR2 SODIM SODIM and will happily plug into a DDR2 SODIM connector, but don't go slotting it into your PC because the pins don't do the same thing at all. This is, after all, a complete computer. The module is aimed at those wishing to embed their Raspberry Pi into their devices with a form factor more suitable for the task. All data and power is dealt with via the DDR2 SODOM-like connector, making it for a very compact device. The Pi Foundation points to the likes of NEC as an example, where the electronics giant has used the diminutive board as the heart of some monstrous digital signage. It, also ha it has also made an appearance in media players and industrial control systems. The Compute Module 3 Plus is a drop-in replacement for the previous versions from a form factor and electrical perspective. However, power supply limitations will keep the CPU at 1.2 gigahertz and instead of the 1.4 gigahertz of the full-size Pi, Pi 3B+. 
Storage is perhaps the biggest change. There are now 8, 16, and 32 gigabyte ver gigab gigab yeah, just gigabyte. Yep. Gigabyte versions <laughs> costing $30, $35, and $40 respectively. There is also a flashless version for those that need it. The foundation plans to keep Compute Module 3 Plus available until at least January 2026 and, in words that will bring joy to Pi fans of the world over, stated that this is the last in a line of 40 nanometer based Raspberry Pi products, indicating a clearing of the decks before the next generation makes an appearance. Wonderful. So we're going to see, uh, a, a, you know, big upgrades as far as those kinds of SOCs go. Exactly. Uh, now, I have to say, <laughs> Sodim, the Sodim chips. Cause, yes. Because somehow Sodom sounds... Wrong. Like wrong. So sodium, sodium. <laughs> I, uh, I know. <laughs> so many technical terms on Category Five TV, uh, but it, basically, think of a RAM module, yes. and it's a full computer right. within the the uh, the connector of a of a sodium. So you're able to plug it into like mul you know you got a board that has multiple connectors and can plug those in, and boom, you've got computers. And now with the r Raspberry Pi three B plus, right, built on board, which is pretty sweet so it's very exciting mm -hmm. I like it I love single board computers I love uh, like I'm starting to get into making mm -hmm. creating more and more um, like I'm working on things with NEMS Linux where you know I'm, I'm soldering connectors to different things and so these kinds of chips are pretty cool they're perfect what I think is most exciting though for the Raspberry Pi fans is that we're finally maybe going to see an end of line to the older like the 40 nanometer yes, and exactly. moving on to faster boards maybe if we can get away from that then we can get past the one gigabyte of RAM limitation yep. of the SOC which for me is a real limitation of the Raspberry Pi uh, and it doesn't matter which model you have being limited and capped off at one gigabyte of RAM is just like that's killer it's yeah, like it really is. you really can't do a lot with one gig of RAM anymore unless you're doing like certainly I mean there are obviously use cases where a Raspberry Pi is fantastic uh, you know you're you're making little maker trinkets or whatever you know right. whatever Te there, there are uses term. maker trinkets i don't know <laughs> the stuff that i'm doing though like the programming that i'm doing really benefits from like two gigabytes or higher of ram so anything at the one gigabyte cap of a yes. raspberry pi seems to be you know like a performance suffers and yeah. you really start to you, you know i have to start working with zram in the kernel and compressing the ram uh compressing the temp folder and things like that into RAM, and so it really becomes tough. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we're going to see in the next couple of years, because it seems to be every two years or so, yeah, that's right. um, we're going to see something kind of shift there with Raspberry Pi. It's good times. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook has revealed plans to integrate WhatsApp, Instagram, and Messenger. While all three will remain standalone apps, at a much deeper level, they will be linked so messages can travel between the different services. The plan was first reported in the New York Times and is believed to be a personal project of Facebook's founder, Mark Zuckerberg. Once complete, the merger would mean that a Facebook user could communicate directly with someone who only has WhatsApp account. This is currently impossible as the applications have no common core. The work to merge the three elements has already begun and is expected to be completed by the end of 2019 or earlier next year. Facebook probably didn't want to talk about this in the middle of a privacy scandal, but its hand was forced by insiders taking to the New York Times. Until now, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Messenger have been run as separate and competing products. Integrating the messaging parts might simplify Facebook's work. It wouldn't need to develop competing versions of new features such as Stories, which all three apps have added with inconsistent results. Cross-platform messaging may also lead the way for businesses on one platform to message potential customers on another. And it may make it easier for Facebook to share data across the three platforms to help its targeted advertising efforts. But bigger still, it makes fat Facebook's suite of apps a much tighter interwoven collection of services. That could make the key parts of Facebook's empire more difficult to break up and spin off if governments and regulators decide that it is necessary. 
Linking the three systems marks a significant change as Facebook at Facebook as now as before now it has let Instagram and WhatsApp operate as largely independent companies. The decision comes as Facebook faces repeated investigations and criticisms over the way it has handled and safeguarded user data. Comprehensive linking user data at a fundamental level may prompt regulators to take another look at its data handling practices. Hmm. So, I don't have Facebook. You don't anymore, yeah. I do not anymore, but I'll, many of my family members still do. Mm -hmm. And I, to be honest, before I read the story, didn't know that WhatsApp was even like a relative. Part of their family. Yeah. Now, yeah. I don't have WhatsApp right now, but it has, tr like I have in the past thought, oh yeah, maybe I'll get WhatsApp because it's easy when my family's on vacation to oh, yes. message because mm -hmm. it's just like... So what if it could communicate with Facebook? Wouldn't right. Wouldn't that be convenient? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't hate that. I think that coming from... No, so I know that you want to talk on the privacy end and the data privacy and data collection and all that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> for me, this coming from a company who cut off XMPP from their offerings. So this is a protocol that's open that is uh, able to communicate with Pigeon and other third-party applications and being able to connect. Uh, maybe it would have made Messenger um, something that could have been used with um, if this, then that. Uh, a lot easier, mm -hmm. you know, without having to hack around it. So, um, so keeping in mind, so this is a company that wants to keep everything that they do internal. Mm -hmm. They don't want to open it up to allow other platforms to to use it. Discord. It took me an afternoon to mm -hmm. write a bridge to be able to communicate directly with IRC. Right, uh, which is wonderful. Oh, yeah, the API is there and it's open and it's, it's able to, yeah. Um, there's such a freedom and such a flexibility there. So Facebook wanting to, hey, let's make it so that the internal behind the scenes communicates together. I think it's a good idea from a user perspective, but mm -hmm. is it the right approach? See, and I, I mean, as soon as Sasha started reading the story, I'm going, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm, nope, don't like it. Because, but why? So right now, one of the, appeals to people using WhatsApp is the mm -hmm. encryption mm -hmm. and the fact that your well, conversations are protected. So keep in mind, could this mean that Facebook is going to have end-to-end -end encryption and Messenger and everything else? Well, possibly, but at the same time, I don't think that's the key issue mm -hmm. because right now WhatsApp is it's, it's to your phone, it is the encrypted conversation, and I know for different groups that I, that I organize, that I'm part of like organizations mm -hmm. some of the conversations we have um this makes it sound like we're doing something bad but we want the encryption <laughs> encrypted conversations because you know we might have a conversation here about this topic that we don't want getting out for privacy reasons right. to sure. other members yeah and so with that we've adopted to whatsapp because of the encryption to it and i'm just seeing a whole plethora of issues of integrating this into facebook it's like oh now you can message through facebook on on whatsapp mm. and suddenly you lose that privacy aspect sure because when it comes to facebook i find that quite frankly the world so, is not very conscious of does facebook not own whatsapp right now they own it but it's a standalone Okay. It's a separate application, yeah. separate business. Right. So, so now they're they, just going to like... They don't talk. And so now yeah. Facebook is looking to make everything talk. Mm -hmm. And they're all going to cross-platform. And I mean, we know all the issues that people have had with Facebook. And we know all the issues that people have with computers and malware and ransomware and spyware. And everybody okay. loads Facebook on their computer. So suddenly you're co connecting with a WhatsApp conversation group and it's all on your Facebook. It's like, come on. I I feel like in Facebook's defense. Oh, here we go. That there's no way with what has been coming out in the media about them lately that encryption is not top of mind for them. Sure. I feel like it has got to be the start of every conversation that they have, right? So I yeah. think that they would not forego the privacy aspect of WhatsApp to integrate it with Messenger. I think instead they'd use the strengths of WhatsApp and integrate those into Messenger. Like, I think that that's what they would do. Well, possibly, but what I'm trying to get at, it's not the fact that they're foregoing the privacy aspect and the, and, and the protection of it. It's mm -hmm. the fact that you're now opening it up. Right. Like, I mean, that's like saying, hey, I can only ever carpool with one other person in my car because I don't like people in my car. So, like, hey, look, I'm going to add three people to my car. 
Right. And like you just, as soon as you start opening up, you have issues, and I don't like this. And the amount of times that Facebook's been hammered and hammered again from privacy issues and data collection issues, I think this is just going to open up a whole other issue. It's a lawsuit waiting to happen. As a Facebook user, Jeff is their biggest fan. Yeah. We'll see how it shapes up. <laughs> Apple says it's banning Facebook's research app that collects users' personal information. Facebook is at the center of another privacy scandal, and this time it, it hasn't just angered users, it has also angered Apple. Apple says Facebook broke an agreement it made with Apple by publishing a research app for iPhone users that allowed the social giant to collect all kinds of personal data about those users. The app allowed Facebook to track users' app history, their private messages, and their location data. Facebook's research effort reportedly targeted users as young as 13 years old. As of last summer, apps that collect that kind of data are against Apple's privacy guidelines. That means Facebook couldn't make this research app available through the App Store, which would have required Apple approval. Instead, Facebook apparently took advantage of Apple's developer enterprise program, which lets approved Apple partners like Facebook test and distribute apps specifically for their own employees. In those cases, the employees can use third-party services to download beta versions of apps that aren't available to the general public. Apple doesn't review and approve those, these apps the way it does for the App Store because they're only supposed to be downloaded by employees who work for the app's creator. Facebook, though, used this program to pay non-employees as much as $20 per month to download the research app without Apple's knowledge. Apple's response via PR rep this morning, we designed our enterprise developer program solely for the internal distribution of apps within an organization. Facebook has been using their membership to distribute a data collecting app to consumers, which is a clear breach of their agreement with Apple. Any developer using their enterprise certificates to distribute apps to customers or to cons consumers will have their certificates revoked, which is what we did in this case to protect our users and their data. Facebook pushed back on the idea that it did anything wrong in collecting the user's data. Facebook says that this program has been ongoing since 2016, which could be evidence that the company wasn't trying to skirt Apple's new policies. Facebook did not, however, comment on whether or not it violated Apple's policies by distributing the app through the developer enterprise program. There are a lot of reasons Facebook wants to know what apps people are using, which explains why it went to such lengths to get around Apple's App Store guidelines. It's unclear if Facebook's actual data collection through this research app poses any risks to the company. Facebook did pay users for using the app, but Facebook is also under investigation from the FTC, which is looking into its data privacy practices. Anything that feels fishy will most certainly attract regulators' attention. Fantastic. Just what we needed. Another Facebook story about their data collection policies. Right. Oh, so. no. Facebook. I feel like I should rest my case on the previous news article yeah. just on this one. Let's alone. move on. <laughs> Seriously? I know. What? But here's the That's thing. Why is shady. this a surprise? Like, I Facebook feel... builds their business off data collection. So if they're going to find a loophole to utilize something to collect data, they're going to do it. Well, if I pay you $20 and you sign an agreement, I pay you $20 a month, you're now an employee. Well, exactly. I've gotten around the terms and conditions of the Apple Developer Network. Right. Uh, not and, necessarily. Well, because you've got employment you've, laws that determine yeah, what yeah, an employee yeah, yeah. is. We, what maybe a freelance employee? Freelance does not count. I don't because that's contracted. Don't shoot Case me down. Case in point: man. Look at uh, Uber. Yeah. In the UK, true. Court yeah. of Appeals. But I'm just saying, like, is that is that a justification? Like, it, it, the twenty dollars a month is that a way of saying? No. Not at all. Well, you're looking at it from a legal perspective. No, true. But is that a justification to the end user? Like, I, I don't know. I didn't see it. I feel like right? their only defense is that they've been doing it for longer than the regulations have been Maybe. in place. Okay, so yeah, when you said that, I'm going, all right, fair enough. So prior to the regulations, if they were allowed to do it, that's one thing. But sure. when the regulations change, you can't say, oh, well, uh, I, uh, the rules changed, and so I was doing it before the rules, so therefore you can't make me do it, follow the rules now. Like, that's stupid. <laughs> But that's an ignorant response right there. 
I, I feel like at this point there wasn't a stop sign there last week. <laughs> That's right. So why should so I why stop should today? I have to stop? Right. Yeah, exactly. Like, come on. I feel okay. like Facebook I see what has saying. gone so far in trying to mine information from people's various devices and softwares and all that kind of stuff yeah. that it's it's almost become like a, an obsession for the company to go on. We need more ways to get information because we're going to get blocked. Oh, absolutely. This hole. And, yeah. and so. But this is what they're doing. That's, their, think, oh, that's, that's their currency. That's, that's how they make money. Exactly. I get that. But play within the rules. Who does? But who makes the rules? They're the, one of the biggest companies in the world. I know. This, so but who this makes is, the rules? This is the thing, though. I think they've gone too far. They've collected too much and done it in shady ways that they're forcing regulatory oversight that's going to put regulations in place that's going to cause problems for everybody had they have just stayed within their sandbox and said okay this is what is sure. socially acceptable and not going to get us caught they went "Ooh, look over there and they how, went way too far and now everybody's going to go Prah! i and feel like how, fences around them. how big of a company would they have got gotten to if they had been playing by those rules like they're they're who they are now because of what they've done okay but what happens once right? all those regulations get put in place they're used to playing in they, this area you put a fence right. around them like this they're gonna go Pfft. and then what's what's left mm. i think the key thing is not to forget <laughs> as, as consumers right yeah don't forget Let's keep in mind these kinds of things that we hear in the news right. and, and remember them so that when we circle back six months from now and there's something else happening, th I think part of the problem as consumers is that we forget of these kinds of violations to our privacy. And, and this is not affecting me. No. But this could very well affect my daughter, like my child. Right. And, and mm -hmm. to think that 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 is uh, potentially an issue that we're, that is worrisome to me. And I know we can't stay on this topic because we've got more yeah. news stories, but one of the interesting things that we found from a, a sociology standpoint is that the current millennial generation and you know versions around that, uh, they don't care. The, the, the mindset is they've got all my information anyway, right. so why should I be data conscious about my privacy? Which and so they just I don't, don't care. That's a generalization, Jeff, and I don't it, like to do it, that. It is, but I'm hearing it a lot more because as these things are popping up, I'm talking to people that I know going, be aware of this. And the, and the response overwhelmingly To been, be fair. Yeah, they've already got the information anyway. However, to be fair to, the, to that generation, there's a, an entire other side, and, and this is mm -hmm. not relevant to the story, but th to be fair to your comment, uh, there is an entire other side of, of young people who have grown up with the technology and understand data privacy yep. and say, I will not mm -hmm. give my information because I understand it. Yes. Yes. So there's a whole, comp yeah, you know, is, it's a, there maybe there it's a 50 50 sure. split. I don't know. I think uh, what I've learned over, you know, with my discussions with like uh, Tony Anscombe from ESET and, and uh, talking about data privacy, realizing that uh, it's kind of our generation that, mm. that is the biggest problem because we grew up in a time when Facebook was starting up and it was so exciting to be able to share so much information with so many <laughs> yes. people right. so easily. Yeah. Yeah. And so we grew up thinking that this was okay. Yeah. So it's our generation now that is really the biggest concern when it comes to data privacy and our data is already out there. Yeah, is it the true. younger generation? Maybe not. Maybe you're wrong there. Mm -hmm. That's just one, yeah. one subset. What are your thoughts? Comment below. <laughs> That's how I move on. See, that's how I like tell. That's how I tell Jeff. Okay, shut up. We're gonna move on. <laughs> IBM hopes one million faces will help fight bias in facial recognition. IBM thinks that the data being used to train facial recognition systems isn't diverse enough. The tech giant released a trove of data containing one million images of faces taken from a Flickr data set with one million photos and videos. A hundred million even. A hundred million. <laughs> one hundred million photos and videos. The images are and annotated with tags related related to features including cranial facial measurements, facial symmetry, age and gender. 
Researchers at the company hope that those specific details will help developers train their artificial intelligence powered facial recognition systems to digitally identify faces more fairly and accurately. John Smith, a fellow and lead scientist at IBM, said facial recognition technology should be fair and accurate. In order for the technology to advance, it needs to be built on diverse training data. Smith stressed the importance of a variety of variety in data sets for facial recognition systems to reflect real world diversity and reduce the, the rate of error in matching a face to a person. Experts have warned on the potential for artificial intelligence to be biased. Research has shown that facial recognition technology is much more adept at making out the faces of white males than it is with minorities. IBM itself has been the target of criticism over its facial recognition system. A paper by MIT researcher Joy Bulwami published last year found that IBM Watson's visual recognition platform had an almost 35% error rate when it came to identifying darker skinned females and a less than 1% error rate for identifying lighter skinned males. Wow. Studies such as this have heightened concerns over the use of facial recognition in areas like law enforcement and the potential for AI powered racial profiling. That's a scary thing that I've never really given much consideration to. But mm -hmm. if the data set is confined to a certain right. group, yeah, yeah. well, the, the AI is going to be biased. And, and it's not lost on me how you know we're learning about the fact that the AI needs to be not generic and you know able to, you know, not generic at all. And, and the guy doing the research is John Smith. Isn't that, that funny? That's I know. not lost like, on me at all. Don't giggle out loud. John Smith says. Yeah. Yeah. True story. True story. It actually happened. You saw it here tonight. That's yeah. Right. Ah. It's, uh, you know, I've never fully, and uh, shockingly, I've never fully trusted the technology behind facial recognition because of all the challenges that have come with it. I mean, it's one mm -hmm. thing to look at, say, fingerprint analysis, which mm -hmm. has been going on for so long now, and there's... I mean, other than the fact that there's different identifiers, it follows the same pattern. But when it comes to facial recognition, it's totally different. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, all it could take is, you know, a little bit of change in facial hair or throwing on some glasses to skew the entire thing. Yeah. And I mean, how many times have we had stories where it's like, oh, this computer's got the facial recognition. Oh, a picture cracked it. Sure. Well, last right. week we learned about AI and how it's going to be growing to the point of being human-like. Mm -hmm. And I think until it reaches that point, like I can look at Sasha and I, that's Sasha. You right. see Sasha and you know that's Sasha. You see Jeff and you know that is Jeff. Right. You see me and you know that is bald nerd. Right. But will an AI, it, AI, is it at that point now? No. No, about but, but okay. Can I just take it just to a weird spot for a moment? Sure. I just watched the documentary on Ted Bundy. Okay. He was, after he escaped from prison, he was rearrested for a traffic infraction okay. and held in a prison and lied about his name. And even though there were a ton of FBI most wanted pictures and such, mm -hmm. he had grown out his facial hair and human beings couldn't recognize that he was who he was. Sure, yeah. it happens right? all the time. It happens all the time. I actually what? trust that that event... Pardon? What? But like humans couldn't humans couldn't could AI. Well, what I'm saying is once we develop this AI, I feel like the AI would have done a better job Do so? at figuring out, hey, this is that guy than we could ourselves. Okay, I see. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that I mean, I have a lot of faith in AI, as you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that it could do better than us. We just have to train it how to do so. So these pictures and this facial recognition and these, you know, exposure to all different types of faces, yeah. right? That is, that's the win because, yeah, you see me and you see Sasha, right? But I could change how I look. I could change my hair. Right. I could change my glasses. But I, as a human, would still recognize... Well, but you say that in this instance, it wasn't that It, that it wasn't, wasn't recognizable. It wasn't recognizable, right. right? But that's because you're not looking... Like, you're looking at the extras on the outside of me, where I think that AI will be looking at, like, my bone structure as well. But someone right? who knows oh. you... 
like thinking of the AI piece and comparing that to right. human intelligence. I know Jeff well enough that when he grows in his beard, I still know that who he is. I would still right. recognize him from across the street. Right. But would everybody? No, right? not necessarily. Boy, no. I was at the gym, saw somebody that I've known for years, and they're like, Jeff. Oh, okay. I was like, took them some yes. time. And they're like, wow, dude, beard totally changed you. Yeah, yeah. I right. Like, and I got fat. <laughs> You were at the gym. I was yeah. at the gym trying to unfat. So slug them. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, but what about things like identical twins? Like, I, I've known a couple of sets of identical twins uh, growing up, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I can look at them, and I know the difference. Absolutely. Right. Like, there's just minute things. But, yeah. But I wonder, would AI... And facial recognition, oh, man. no to I look would for say, an identical twin. We're going to get there. We're I would get say there. yes, because I would say that identical twins, anybody, has different micro expressions, right? Mm -hmm. And AI is going to be smart enough to distinguish one versus the other, right? Mm -hmm. I have identical twin sisters, and I can see I the difference in them. Oh, no? Huh. You've met one of them. Well, we're not that when okay. we're not there yet. But we as humans can recognize the difference between identical twins. Right. Yeah. We're not there yet with AI, but could this be so Watson getting this infusion of a hundred million faces yeah. from Flickr, being able to recognize other races, other other um, ethnicities, uh, if you you know, like just other sexes. I mean, it, why is it white males? Is what was the data set that they were given? Are, are, is that like the majority of the base on Flickr? I just, or? I don't know where <laughs> it comes from. Maybe, maybe that's the issue. It's, yeah. like, it's all white males on Flickr. But, but my, like the whole point is, is that maybe with an increased data set, it's yeah. just about it's, training the computer because the computer needs to know. Yeah. Because it, it's like, it's, it's like a, an maybe idiot, Facebook an should build an idiot puppy. <laughs> It's just got to learn. It's just got to learn, and then it'll yeah. get there, and then we'll all be better people because of it. I hope so. <laughs> I really, really I hope so, I believe so. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick look at cryptocurrency this week. Uh, according to CoinGecko, here's what the crypto market looked like as of 1,800 hours Eastern time on Wednesday, January 30th, 2019. Bitcoin is at $3,462.34, down $70.07 U.S. Litecoin uh, actually gained just a fraction at $31.75 USD. $108.32 for Ethereum. Monero is at $43.46, just a little bit down from last week. Stellite and Turtlecoin, the little guys. Well, Stellite's sitting around where it was last week, and Turtlecoin is down a little bit at one15 ten thousandths of a cent remember the cryptocurrency market never closes and it's always volatile big thanks to roy w nash solbu and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week thanks for watching the category 5.tv newsroom don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight linux bias and for more free content be sure to check out our website from the category 5.tv newsroom i'm sasha rickman i'm robbie ferguson and i'm jeff weston Thank you again for being with us again this week. Good How many job. times can I say again in one, one sentence? Yes. I, we're, so far. It's, <laughs> say it again. It's, yeah, Four. we'll say it again. Uh, it's been great having you here. I uh, can't wait to see you again next week. We look forward to every single Wednesday night, and I hope you do too. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.